Okay. All right. Hello. Thank you all. <clears throat> Thank you all for coming to this first ever Mixed Blood Zoom event. The Mixed Blood Project invites writers, uh, invites to campus writers who are interested in talking about the relation between innovative writing and the languages of race. Uh, writers, which is to say visitors to the project, give a talk, that's today's event, and a reading, that's tomorrow's event. So please come back tomorrow for the, uh, for the reading at the same time at noon. I'm pleased to welcome Abanu Kapil. Her talk this afternoon is titled Performance and Shame Discuss, and a discussion with audience members will, uh, will follow, uh, follow the talk. Uh, Bono Kapil is the author of Schizophrenia, uh, Incubation, A Space for Monsters, How to Wash a Heart, and many other unsettled works, books that traverse the terrains of poetry, memoir, and imaginative fiction. Reading her, I feel the shape of my, my old friend, the arrivant or arrivant, the one who is always arriving and yet has never arrived the figure who disturbs the conceptual order of identity, community, nationality, and citizenship. Uh, it's a figure I knew something about, but the quite useful word itself, arrivant, came to me some years ago through the writing of Kamal Brathway. By way of, of my introduction for today's talk, I would quote from a couple of places in Schizophrene, this book, which Pamela Liu describes as an account of immigration and trauma told through memory, vision, and hallucination. In that book, Banu Kapil wrote on page one, for some years, I tried to write an epic on partition and its transgenerational effects. The high incidence of schizophrenia is di in diasporic Indian and Pakistani communities. The parallel social history of domestic violence, relational disorders, and so on. Towards the end of the project, I felt the great strength of the page, its, a, its ability as a fibrous surface to deflect the point of my pen. So what she did after, after that realization was uh, she threw the handwritten final draft into the garden of her house in Colorado and let winter and spring have their way with it. Uh, when the warm weather came, she retrieved the notebook and began to write again from the fragments, the phrases and lines still legible on the warped, decayed, but curiously rigid pages. Later in the book, she writes, it is psychotic to draw a line between two places. It is psychotic to go. It is psychotic to look. Psychotic to live in a different country forever. Psychotic to lose something forever. The compelling con conviction that something has been lost is psychotic. Even the airplane's dotted line on the monitor as it descends to Heathrow is purely weird ambient energy. It is psychotic to submit to violence in a time of great violence, and yet it is psychotic to leave that home or country, the place where you submitted again and again, forever. Indeed, it makes a subsequent involuntary arrival a stressor for psychosis. Schizophrenia is rhythmic touching something lightly many times. A fire moving sideways through the trees. Please welcome Banu Kapil. Uh, Banu, you should turn your mic on. You're, you're, you're muted. Oh, no. Thank you. Um, thank you, Cecil. It's, it's really just lovely to see everybody here. Um, it's nighttime where I am and noon perhaps where you are or 2 p.m. Something like that. Um, I'd like to thank um, Cecil and uh, Jess and all of the staff and students who've made this space possible or workable today. Um, it's such an honor to be invited and I was thinking today and yesterday that my career or my life as a writer really did begin in the Bay Area. I remember a long ago reading with um, Stephanie Young was the curator and I read with Arnold Kemp. It was my first ever reading in the United States and it was in a space facing the ocean. I, I wouldn't know the name of it. 
And I, I think Arnold went on first and then it was the break. I knew no one. And I just stood outside like shivering, shaking, just overwhelmed um, before it was my turn to, to go on. I think I stayed with Sumi Kuiper who left every day to go and write her novel in the public library. So I have a lot of memories um, of being there with you. Um, I remember the aggression conference at Small Press Traffic. What was it? Trauma in the Asian avant-garde at CIIS. Um, the Midnight Supper Club with Trong Tran and MG Du Friends, um, and on and on. So I'm really uh, grateful and honored to be invited. And it's uh, part of why I said yes. So um, here we are. It's an honor to be invited to contribute to the Mixed Blood series uh, talk, which I will be giving today from the interior of a national monument, which is to say the ground or campus of Churchill College in Cambridge, where I am this year grateful to be an artist by fellow. Today, I'll be delivering my talk as a triptych, beginning with some notes on performance and shame from which the talk as a whole takes its title. To work with this material, I dislodged two artifacts paragraphs from a recent essay published by the Berkeley Poetry Review, Hello Scout, if you're there, with an interest in the stains those artifacts might leave on the table. Is this the table? Can you predict the future, I used to think, by studying the detritus left by the close work with fragments, that is, the registration or ordering of fragments, to compile a rudimentary archive, the archive, a working definition. It's happened and there's no way to not know what it resembles or what its aftermath will be. For the second part of my talk, I'll read what I could not in the end publish pressing, delete, or save as draft when I wrote it straight into my blog, the blood roaring in the sockets of my liver, kidneys, heart, and lungs at the thought of making it appear. This second part is also a central panel to think through the triptych, and it's called Things That Happened to Me in a, in a University. I actually don't know if I'll be able to read it aloud when I get to it, and so we'll see. Please feel free to deduct 15% of my speaker's fee if my talk is by necessity retracted. That said, as someone who might now be described as an elder, I'd like to dedicate my talk to my descendants, the ones who come from elsewhere to be here for now and take the opportunity to be more deeply in service to them. How can I undo the racialized outcome of restricting the range of what a talk might enact, for example, knowing the cost of that enactment, how rapidly it becomes a kind of proof of acting out? Another way to put it might be this. For educators, staff members, or students with backgrounds of ancestral or geographical dispossession, what is the allostatic load of teaching, administering, or receiving a training in creative writing in a university that condenses, provides access to, and might also then withhold its colonial spoils? The part of this framing, which I've put in quotes, thus not visible in a talk delivered verbally or digitally, comes from Nadine El Inani's writing on immigration law, bordering Britain, law, race, and empire. It's a work that has given me courage this October to think of the writer, not only as an oscillating presence, subject, alien, but as also an indestructible witness, descendant. In the time we lived in, it was hard to think, it was hard to write, when the links between creativity and survival had been broken. What helped us 
was to tell the truth about the institutional and social settings in which the practice of freedom, the poems we so longed to write, was also taking place. We weren't helpless. We were entitled, as you will be, to a good night's sleep. With the third part of my talk, the right-hand panel of the triptych, where the patrons so often feature or cluster in the medieval construction, I will introduce a current project which is taking place in relation to the monument to Winston Churchill I am an occupant of. For that part of my talk, it might be helpful to show slides of what I've gathered and I'm thinking about with some questions I've begun to form. I'm at the start of this new work, but it continues the themes of trauma, architecture, and narrative that the central panel records through lived experience. If the central panel takes place mostly in a corridor or at the entrance to a classroom, then the right-hand panel makes an inside out of what is outside, an investigation that hasn't formed as poetry yet, only a series of walks, encounters, close observation and touch. On that note, I'll begin. Performance and shame. Discuss, part one. Uh, some performances went well. Afterwards, the curator ordered a weak fish, a cod or place, and we ate it in silence in the cafeteria of the art museum, clicking our glasses of cold white wine above the plates. It is perhaps more accurate to say that I felt very little, having trained myself to be present during the performance, acutely so, but afterwards to forget it. Why? Some performances went poorly, and afterwards, for weeks, I could not rid myself of an excruciating shame. I could compile this talk, which I cannot give in person, from the notes I kept after both kinds of performances. The performances that went well, the performances that did not go well. There's a kind of lag or net or interval between two kinds of very strong impressions. The experience of performance is one thing, but there is another fleeting, but also eternal experience that comes immediately afterwards. What is happening in the moments that a work is not received or is received in a different time to the one in which it was made is the energy of a sickening moment, the moment that a performance falls flat, so dissimilar to the life bringing or life supporting energies that are so often hallmarks of cultural or literary expression, is the moment that shame blooms, crucial, lexical in another way. I'm curious about the courage it takes to write again after so many years and so many impacts of various kinds. I'm curious about performance as a mode of sacrifice. Imagine the cobalt sand of a volcanic beach you enter the broiling and brimming water. Instantly, the jade bracelet so recently given to you as a gift is ripped off your body, like that. Undeveloped writing, a question or proposition that is working for change, but which cannot do its work at the time in which it is written. Is there a link, for example, between psychological oppression and writing Thing that doesn't resolve as a book. I'm thinking of the body load in particular of racism, sexism, the effects of chronic, unremitting and deflected attention, the combination of extreme hypervigilance and exhaustion upon the desire to write a book in the first place. Writing these words, I recall a performance at Kelly Writer's House in Philadelphia Lucas de Lima introduced me, then sat down. The audience, mostly white, as it is with the experimental poetry scene, 
in the United States filled the first 15 rows of the venue. At the back on a navy blue velvet sofa sat the five people of color in the room. It's possible that I am misremembering the number of the rows, the chairs, and the color or fabric of the sofa. I had the sudden terrible feeling that I did not know who I was looking at and who it was that was looking at me. Performance in that instant was a way of restoring my dignity. There's documentation of the event on Pen Sound of what I did that night in order to continue on with the reading itself. But when I try to write about it here as a description of what happened, it lacks power and meaning. The performance in London goes well. I fly back to Colorado and am soon back in the routine of making my son a tea in the morning with warm milk before school. I bring it to him in bed, then sit outside next to the pond, adjusting after my long travel from the United Kingdom, waiting for him to wake up. Birds are quacking, frogs are fizzing. To pass the time, I check my phone, email, then Twitter. At the top of my feed, I read this. It has come to my attention that in response to questions about their position on current issues, the director of at where I work has been using a program I designed to claim that the has been responding to issues of structural anti-blackness for the past two years. The young black curator, a curator at the venue that hosted my recent performance continues, nothing I'm saying here is any different from what I have said for years in curatorial meetings, staff meetings and one-on-ones. We need to confront racism within this institution. We need to champion black artists and target black audiences. Powerful, brave. A question I'd like to pose as part of the mixed blood curation on race and creative writing is this. As performers, how can we do the difficult work of asking why spaces that welcome us do not afford an equal welcome to others? I know this firsthand as someone who spoke up about appropriation, plagiarism and racism in the English department I was once a part of. It was painful once I was out of that workplace to see a succession of radical writers of color accept their invitations to speak or teach there and then to express their gratitude at the inclusivity and radical nature of the local culture that had invited them to perform within it. Nevertheless, I have to train myself to answer the same question. On how many occasions have I done precisely the same as a fleeting, honored guest? Has my presence been painful for others in precisely the same way? I suspect that it has. Curation, a checklist, one. Look around the room you're in right now who is not here. Two, what do you, you never want to experience in this space? Three, can you describe an instance in which you used your power or status in the institution or community group you're a part of in service of someone with less power or less status, even as and when you experienced or currently experience yourself as down power by dint of your racial or ethnic background. Four, can you describe an instance in which someone in a white or white adjacent body, body blocked harm that was directed at you or a person in a down power position or role within your organization? I've been invited to read an excerpt from the Anthology of Indian Writing in English at AWP, the Conference of American Writing Programs that is held annually in an off-season city somewhere in the continental United States. Just before I am about to go on, 
one of the other writers on the panel, a South Asian woman, pokes her head at me and says, you're so much older and fatter than you look in your pictures. I reply, let's get this straight. The event is about to start. We've never met before. I'm about to read my poetry in front of a hundred people and you're choosing this moment to tell me how bad I look to you? Yes, she replies. I thought you would want to know. I thought I could use this talk as a way to metabolize the performances I gave last autumn when I returned to England after many years in the United States, a succession of performances that fell flat. But now that I'm here writing the talk, I don't have the desire I did when I conceived of the talk to revisit these experiences. Perhaps I can say, but it was a cultural shock to return to the place I left long ago, never expecting to return, and that for many months I felt wordless, quiet, stunned and anxious. If performance began for me as a diasporic technology, a way to make contact with the parts of a scene I could not get to in writing, memories or environments for which in the Western United States there were no sensorial clue, clue, cues, it had become the thing I was invited to do instead of the writing itself. Invited to build performances in European venues, I realized that what I wanted instead was a bath. I wanted to slip into the boiling hot steaming bath, fragrant with clary sage and lavender and ylang ylang, and then afterwards, what I wanted was a glass of icy water. To this end, just before lockdown began, and not knowing they would be cancelled anyway, I cancelled events in Manchester, Oslo and Turin, building capacity around disappointing others. I've been writing and rehearsing a play inspired by a scene in my childhood my participation in a competition at the High Grove swimming pool, part of a camp run by Olympic medalist and national hero, Duncan Goodhue. I know Lydia Yuknovich, and so the play is not going very well. Like most things I write, it's how in the writing of work that is almost or always unfinished, that I start to think or try to think about shame, performance, and autobiographical writing. Perhaps it is the difference between the way we make art at home, writing a novel on yellow paper, then crumpling it up to make a pair of earrings or a dress, and what happens when we present this art or perform it outside the home that constitutes the marker I am tracing, the surge, of interleukin-6 that accompanies a shame process in the body. In the swimming competition, I recall, I came last in a relay, a length behind everyone else. My body was developing fast, a more fleshy body body than the bodies of the other girls in the race who were 12 or 13 like me. At 12, the only brown girl in the club, I had a body that much resembled the body I would have at 22 or 31. Also, I couldn't do butterfly, of which the last leg of the race comprised. The stands were cheering me on, rooting for me, you could say, as the other girls who had all finished sat poolside, calling out my name. Come on, Barnow, you can do it. Heaving out of the water in an ungainly butterfly lunge, I looked up to see my father standing behind the glass of the viewing gallery above. He, my mother, my aunt and uncle, dressed in their Sunday finery, had come straight from the Gudwara to see me compete. All I remember is my father's face, red or dark brown and throbbing, I knew, with anger. He turned to leave before I had finished, even as the stands had taken up the swimmer's chant, Banu, Banu, 
the swish of my aunt's green and mustard yellow silk shawl as she turned to. Obviously, it was very bad when I got home. I can still recall that slow walk down Eastcote Road like a dripping haddock to what awaited me there. Shame in this story is a story of ethnic density, domination, but also the moment always missed in which speaking up might be possible. At least this was my experience as a young person from a very traditional cultural background. Lately, I feel shame, for example, when I have to describe to another person or contextualize the experiences of ostracism and racism that unfolded in my workplace in the United States, the setting in which I taught a seminar called Writing the Body and yet another seminar called The Literature of Exile and Diaspora. After a poetry reading, did you ever feel as if your skin was coming off? I enter performance and shame into the top level archive available to me online through the University of Cambridge Library and quickly come to Eve Sedgwick, whose practice takes up Foucault's repressive hypothesis in ways that a poet can get behind. Poets, unite. Sedgwick on the work of Sylvan Tompkins from Shame in the Cybernetic Fold. A potentially terrifying and terrified idea or image is taken up and held for as many paragraphs are, as are necessary to burn out the fear response, then for as many more until that idea or image can recur in the text without initially evoking terror. I leave the English department and get a new job teaching for a PhD in sustainability and leadership at the University of Vermont. My co-teacher, Dr. Syra Pinto, is a longtime organizer, a migrant from Honduras and a friend. How do you work with shame as a leader? I asked Syra at the midpoint of the seminar in a lull. Syra responds with the phrase, artifacts of oppression, a reading of shame as the way colonization inscribes itself on bodies and mental states and how exposing these artifacts to view is a way to dislodge the effects of colonization itself from the tissue, says Syra, bringing tears to my eyes a thousand miles away on Zoom. Part two things that happened to me in a university because our task is to make the conditions explicit, Sarah Ahmed. I stand on my own neck, Phil Gatesby, but also how will you metabolize the transgression that you know has already occurred, Ramon Sensei. 20 years of teaching in a university and so here are 20 things. Reversing the auto-deletion that worked so well as a device in poetry, but less so when it came to actual life. Perhaps I can also preface these notes by saying that in the end, I realized I could not metabolize these things through the restorative or legal pathways made available by the institution itself. What helped me in the end was trauma-informed occupational therapy. In 2019, I was diagnosed with thyroid nodules and a buildup of arterial plaque in my carotid artery, something my doctor correlated with the levels of cortisol in my blood, an indicator, she said, of chronic stress. The tissue of the throat, in other words, was where the artifacts of oppression, everything my contract with the university said I could never say had lodged, descendant. If I am the water you will drink from one day, then it's time to get this stuff out of my body. It's time to stop standing on my own neck. One. 
I taught a seminar on metallurgy and narrative, citing two authors. Much later, a student who had participated in the seminar published an essay on metallurgy and narrative, citing the same authors, but not the seminar itself. When I asked her to cite the seminar, she said that she had done so originally, but that the editors of the magazine had edited out her citation in order to make the essay flow better. At this point, as there was an ongoing history of plagiarism involving this student, I said, I don't believe you, too. A student upset that I had not clocked his reference to Leonard Cohen, and I beg your pardon, I'm going to read this one out loud, but um, it has content in which what is inside the body appears beyond it. Um, and is a depiction of violence that I'm still, you know, going to try and read this aloud, but um, please, you know, maybe mute this um, and I'll put my hand up like this when it's, when I finished reading this section. A student upset that I had not clocked his reference to Leonard Cohen sends me an email later that night asking me how, if I, how I would feel if I too experienced pain e.g., quote, while being raped, then boiled alive and eaten by enemy soldiers who had masturbated into the cooking pot, unquote, while my then seven-year-old son looked on. When I alert the chair of my department, a poet, he suggests a facilitated sit-down with the student to work out any, quote, interpersonal issues, unquote. He asks me to be more compassionate as the student is a veteran and has disclosed an alcoholic lapse. I say, no. A restraining order is put in place, but the student is allowed to keep taking classes. And though he cannot come within 20 feet of me, he can look at me as he does with an unblinking and hyper-focused stare whenever I enter the room. For the next two years that he attends the university, I scan the recycling bins next to the classroom door, trying to suppress the fleeting image of the student jumping out and brandishing or aiming a gun. Three, the university photographer was documenting a poetry seminar I was teaching, part of a marketing drive. He paused between takes to say, now that you're no longer beautiful, do you find you can concentrate more easily on your work? I said, what did you say? Four, my colleague shouted during a faculty meeting, Banu, you're such a locus of negativity. I had been speaking about experiences of racism in the university setting we shared and harm reduction for students of color in the classroom. The poet continued, what do you want me to do? Tell me what I should do. And how can I be racist? I have a black nephew. It was at that moment that I stood up, looked at my assembled colleagues, none of whom had a word to say, and said, recreating a scene from Love Actually, that's enough, that's enough now. With that, I turned and left the room forever. Five. The same colleague would often, when I first started teaching, let me know that someone who wishes to remain anonymous had told her that I used too much theory in my classes and not enough examples of works by language poets themselves, a source of concern to her. In that first year, this colleague was my supervisor, a language poet herself. She handed me her book, a hardback copy of her latest suite of poems inspired by East Asian cultural practices and mythologies. Thank you, I murmured. At that point in my career, I did not know what to say or do when such situations arose though I recall vividly the boiling hot shame that followed these confidences, the feeling that my skin was coming off. It was this same colleague who also informed me a few years later, now that you're 40, nobody will find you attractive, especially not in this part of the world. Six, and maybe this is the last one I'll read. A world famous poet known for his radical and mystical approach to somatic writing, took over my seminar when I resigned as part of a protest against institutional racism. At that time, he called me on the telephone 
to let me know he had been offered the seminar and would accept it, citing his childhood history of poverty. Within due course, my own seminar description was deleted and the poet would go on to attest that there was no racism in the beautiful community of experimental, socially progressive writers he was now a part of. How could there be? And that in his opinion, by suggesting such a thing, I was both evil and mentally ill. Well, um, there is a lot more of this sort of stuff and it does get worse. Um, but I will say that like composing this talk inspired me. And so I cut and pasted um, everything that I wanted to say, imagined I could say, would take the opportunity to say, um, and sent it um, in an email to um, the president of um, my former workplace, or one of them, I've had several, um, as well as the associate provost, um, with an indication that they would be free to share you know, what I had written um, with the board of trustees um, and so on. Um, anyway, so even though I'm not like working on my thyroid nodules, if they're still in there right now, I, I did. Um, so it goes on and on and on um, and ends. Descendant, this is the part of my talk which functions as a warning. Don't carry in your body what does not belong to you. Violence rots the brain. Go. Um, sorry, I couldn't see you all because I had to look at my document. I have a third part of my talk, um, the third part of the panel triptych with the patrons and the archive. Um, but Jess and Cecil, I just wanted to check in with you um, if it's okay to continue or should I, you know, pause? I mean, it's great with Winston Churchill and, you know, some oak leaves, but I can also stop. Um, Why don't you go on, please? All right. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Cecil. All right, all right, I shall continue. Um, okay, so part three. No, I'm just going to go back to part two. Um, one of the reasons that I don't think I can continue with part two is because, um, and I realized I wouldn't know it until we were here together. Um, I realize, um, yeah, maybe we can talk about that afterwards. Um, yeah, part three, notes from the archive in which I myself appear as the descendant and have questions to ask. Um, and Jess, at this moment, would you mind um, displaying the first set of slides related to the building itself? Um, and so I don't think you'll be able to see me, everybody else, um, but um, you will be able to see um, the slides. Um, so the, the archive. Um, hey, Banu, I'm just going to interrupt oh. to make sure that, can people see this shared screen of slides now? I see Farid's thumb and Susan's thumb. Excellent. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. Right, um, so the archive um, is the archive center on the grounds of Churchill College, which um, hosts the collections of Winston Churchill and Margaret Thatcher. Um, it's closed at the moment, and though as a by fellow I can access it perhaps, um, I've been taking instead slow walks around its perimeter, observing the water stains, sculpture and remnants found in the landscaping material that edges it and on the immediate grounds. Um, and in one of the images in this series, um, you can see, kind of see it between the kind of concrete um, things. Um, you can see the Pan-African flag um, flying above the college this month, which is Black History Month in the UK um, as part of a campaign by current student Ozarenke Ogbede for 
um, in their words, a prominent reminder of Churchill College's pledge to tackle racism. Seeing the flag on October the 1st, even though I know firsthand how a university's anti-racism or diversity initiatives can become a vehicle for the very thing it purports to disdain, um, seeing the flag shifted something in my body. I walked from my flat to the archive, which is just a few minutes away, maybe one minute if I ran, a notebook in my back pocket, feeling comfortable enough for the first time to pause at the entrance beneath the cameras above. Some context, perhaps it might also be useful to say in the context of a talk on creative writing, to say that Thatcher came to power in the UK in the spring of 1979, a few days after the events of Banon Bonlieu, a work published by Nightboat Books in 2016, in which I documented the decaying sounds or memories of a protest in my West London neighborhood against the decision by a far-right group, the National Front, to hold its annual meeting in Southall's Town Hall. Southall, um, in the 1970s, uh, was an immigrant community in which it was rare, dizzying actually, to see a white face. Here, British subjects, like my family, British subjects from the former colonies had made their home. January 1978, Margaret Thatcher, then the opposition leader, said on TV um, as part of an interview for a program called World in Action, people are really rather afraid that this country might be swamped by people with a different culture. I remember the muscle in my father's jaw bouncing through his skin. And so it went on. Thatcher's affirmation crystallized today as the hostile environment policy enacted by Home Secretary Prithi Patel, a brown British politician whose own parents would not have been admitted to the United Kingdom under the present rules. Nadine El Inani. I argue that British immigration law is a continuation of British colonial power as enacted in the former British Empire, an explicitly white supremacist project. Britain, she continues, must therefore be understood as a contemporary colonial space. On my walks around the archive, a space I don't desire to enter, though it's important to note that it also contains many important anti-colonial papers and works, I'm aware that at all times it contains these words. Quote, I do not admit, for instance, that a great wrong has been done to the native people of America or the black people of Australia. I do not admit that a wrong has been done to these people by the fact that a stronger race, a higher grade race, a more worldly wise race, to put it that way, has come in and taken their place." Unquote. Those are the words of Winston Churchill, whose bronze bust on the steps to the dining hall has been sealed off with chipboard. He also said something people in my family system still recall him saying. I hate Indians. They are a beastly people with a beastly religion. A few steps from the entrance of the archive center is an oak tree that he planted when the college was founded 60 years ago. Here are some branches from this tree that fell to the ground last night or early this morning. Jess, if we could look at the slides marked environment. Um, in one of these images, I think you'll see, and maybe we can pause at that one, Jess, when we come to it, a mushroom that I found on the archive grounds. Um, I've been skim reading on Kindle, Merlin Sheldrake's Entangled Life, essays on mycelial ways of knowing, and I've been thinking about the vegetal, fungal, and medicinal mesh beneath the archive, beneath the archive, and how I might contact what's inside or draw it out uh, through that, what absorbs the blood. The many different kinds of mushrooms which might vanish overnight 
breathe without breathing, opening up an infinite or eternal frame that synchronizes with the non-space of these four or five feet that extend beyond this fortified concrete structure. Sheldrake speaks of networks of mushrooms that can extend a kilometer or more. There's a connectedness or conduit then between these grounds and the campus of the Institute of Astronomy that borders Churchill College on its west side. It's here that I attended for my first few months in Cambridge, weekly lectures at the Kavli Institute for Cosmology, tea beforehand from an ancient urn with a biscuit balanced on the saucer and afterwards a glass of ruby port or orange squash. You don't see the black hole, but you see the energetic effects of the black hole, I scrawled at the back of the lecture room. In reading the archive as a stellar volume, but also always an extreme simulation, is it possible to think about its boundary as a place to sample its antiparticles, everything the archive, archivers whole, spat out? Here, my astronomical capacity comes to an end. Mostly, observing the mushrooms provides an activity that allows me to get on my hands and knees at the threshold, which is where, as a writer, I always want to be. Perhaps I'll close by sharing some artifacts I found right up against the edge of the archive center, in the crease or margin between the wall and the cultivated lawn that surrounds it. Jessica, would you mind bringing those up? Um, and so I don't know if you're looking at it um, yet, but on my first walk, I found what can only be described as a chain. It had not detached from anything above it, but was simply there, discarded, rusting, and yet in its entirety, instantly recognizable as belonging to the regime of colonization, the index of images that is precipitated by that regime a loop of metal and a coiled tail of integrated loops. Two years ago in Chicago at a symposium on art and madness, Edgar Garcia gave a talk in which he said, to continually describe the colonial blockage is to perpetuate it. He also said something I've been thinking about since, the trace comes with its own theory. If the chain is the trace, then how can I evoke this theory? Is the inaccessible archive, the archive in the time of COVID-19, the archive in a contemporary colonial context, a blockage in this sense? Later that night with clay left over from my work the previous year in the Judith E. Wilson drama studio, I packed or coated the chain with what resembled mud, then left it outside, tucked in the roots of a locust tree in my courtyard. By morning, it had rained. The clay melted off. It looked like an animal, one of the foxes that often slips in from the grounds of the observatory itself had taken a shit. In that moment, I discover that the chain is not interested in becoming my next art. A few days later, I find an ear. It's a bronze ear, some sort of fused metal, discarded or tumbled once more in the shale edging of the archive. Listen, I think. This is about listening, but it's also what it is, a body part. One day I looked more closely at the edge material itself through a loop and was satisfied to see the pale orange lichen gripping the shale bits. It's strange to be in a country in which I have access to the earth memory of my childhood, a pit or a cliff. Yesterday, I returned to the shed outer layer of clay, the slurp of it in the garden bed, and saw that it was still damp, not dry. I rolled it into tiny balls or spheres, then arrayed them on a sheet of paper, tearing a post-it into captions as yet to be filled in. 
It reminds me of the blog, I thought, a space in which I felt trust and belonging, though it's closed right now. Into the captions went my secrets in the tiniest possible font. And today, preparing for this talk, I went down there and I found this. I found a rectangle of perfectly cut and thick leather. And so Jess, if we're still in the slides, we can just go back to the talk bit. Um, and so this is the leather and it's the width of a belt. And then right next to it was this tiny installation, I don't know if you can see it, um, of a twig inside a delicate tangle of blue wool. Whose clothing was this? Anyway, that's as far as I've got right now. Um, if it's possible to use this talk as a way of asking a question, I'd be curious if anyone has any experience or ideas about working with archives that are in some way inaccessible, restricted or concealed from public view. What does the restriction simulate? In asking these questions, I'm not sure what the writing that may or may not come from this project will look like, or even if it needs to be more than the notes created for this talk for you. I know only that what I want from writing here on out is the physical memory of what it might look like to live a completely healed life. I want to end the cycle of trauma in my family and kinship circles. I want to lie down in front of that ancient gate. I want to eat the chronology for breakfast. I hope I'm not too late. And that is the end of my talk. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, Banu. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for this. This covered several waterfronts, or touched many waterfronts, I should say. Uh, would you be willing to entertain a little bit of discussion about, about, about this? From yeah, De definitely. Um, also, you know, if I was there, it might be like a clay studio with M.G. Dufresne, um, formerly M.G. Roberts, but now M.G. Dufresne, or Dufresne. Um, so that had been my original plan, that we would have like a community workshop. And um, yeah, and just curious as well about, you know, the work that's happening there. And so um, happy to receive any feedback um, uh, or comments or just just anything you'd like to share um i would simply invite people to <clears throat> unmute themselves and uh and politely ask or, or respond can i say something can Good. you hear me? yes um thank you so much i'm very moved by everything you said basically uh in the in the context of you saying i'm going to say something that's difficult and i'll turn i'll hold up my hand i'm not as a, i think you were warning people that we might not want to hear what you were going to say is that correct yes so i want to say something that i'm not sure if it's okay so i'm going to just say it because i tend not to have a filter anyway this morning i read in the paper that a teacher outside in the suburb of france had been beheaded for teaching what did they call it freedom of speech he made a reference to in his classes about the Charlie Hebdo case of several years ago. And um, so I hope it's okay that I'm telling you, I mean, you might have heard of it already, but it sounds to me like some of what you're talking about, I'm not saying this to alarm you, I'm just saying that your concern and your, and your feeling that what you're talking about has to be heard it seems like you're, you're not the only person that's fighting that fight. I, I'm not being very articulate, but I, did it occur to you when you saw the news that? Um, Judith, thank you for 
uh, your comment. Um, you don't mind that I said that to you, I hope not. <laughs> no, not at okay. all. Life, life is quite short at this stage. Um, you know, one of the first things that I ever wrote in this country, no, I didn't even, maybe I wrote it in transit, but it was published by Kelsey Street Press, um, you know, in the Bay Area. And it was this, tell me what you know about dismemberment. And um, I've been thinking that it's almost time to return to those questions after, well, 20 years. So um, certainly, uh, yes. And also that there are uh, consequences um, to uh, articulating um, in certain ways. Um, actually, there's an extraordinary academic here called Priya Gopal, who wrote a book called Insurgent Empire, who has uh, received, um, you know, kind of heinous ongoing threats um, just from, you know, describing um, quotidian scenes in British culture, let's put it that way. Um, so certainly there it is, um, but that's also not where I think my mind goes or as you were talking, um, and maybe that's the way the back brain works. I immediately like brought forward an index of images from the recent news in India, for example, um, and the, the femicide that is ongoing there. So um, yeah, it's, it's territory that um, is generational uh, and has an immediate impact, but certainly um, the news that you refer to was on the front pages here. Thank you so much. Um, others. I was interested in your, in your question for various reasons about what it might be like to lead a completely healed life. Our question or the wondering, or wondering about that. And I don't, um, and as you stated that, I remember, you know, the image for myself of simply staring out into, into a void, into a, into a, into a blankness, um, you know, ahead. Um, certainly ahead, ahead of me and, uh, and, and maybe to uh, others as others as well. And I'm wondering if you might say a couple more words about what a completely healed life, not what it would look like, but what what kind of possibility would it uh, would it would it suggest? Um, well, it's there in my text, but it's harder to signal that in yeah. a digital talk but one of the things that's been going on over here is strangely receiving you know uh, trainings from the friend that i mentioned dr pinto and this new work that i'm doing in the field of transdisciplinary leadership so as part of that um, i've attended trainings that can happen remotely from the yukon with dr pinto's teachers so Phil Gatesby, um, in the training this summer, um, he just asked very directly, is it, is it okay for you to imagine yourself as healed? Um, and it struck me. Um, and you know, because this is happening like in the Bay Area, I think of participating in and attending Eleni Stokopoulos' Poetics of Healing curation. And I think I can see Petra, like can Norma. I think I can see different people maybe um, who participated in those symposiums that took place over two years. But um, if I think about like, what was the outcome in a way, like with regards to community factors in particular, um, it feels as if things really broke down um, in the poetry community and maybe it was like the opposite of healing. So mm -hmm. um, I remember the conversations we had then and 
you know, my own sort of work with students, like the very generic uh, way um, that one can use this language. But it just like got in there at the last moment and um, it's ahead of me too. But um, yeah, I think it's, um, I think it's almost time um, to stop, um, to stop uh, participating um, in my own destruction. So I can say that as an individual, but uh, it's something that I'm learning from people who are much younger than me um, all over the world. And um, yeah, it's, it's a feeling and a thought of this time and let's keep working on that. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else, um, would anybody else like to contribute to this um, idea of what a completely healed life might look like, feel like? Well, I, I, not to, there's a, there's a, there's a, uh, Every religious context has what, you know, for the Jews, it's a messianic time for, I don't know, other, other religious contexts say that there's a, a potential for that. And for people I know who lead observant lives of all different religions, they don't necessarily think of it as something in the future or something that's just read about. It's something that we need to bring every day into being and live as if. I'm very touched by what you just said about stop participating in my own, that's an amazing quote. I'm gonna think about it all the time. Um, and I think that that's what people are doing when they live their best is that they're as if living healed. There's only, you know, keep on doing it, keep on doing it. Does that make sense at all? <laughs> um, it, it does, Judith. I beg your pardon. I've been I writing my so I've been writing my you. talk all day, so I've gone a little bit um, depleted. And secretly, my mother is getting ready for her bath, like just over there. And the Bollywood is still on on the iPad. So I'm I'm with you, but I'm also um, I'm also somewhere else. Um, thank you, though. Then, then maybe it's time for us to to close this close this down, perhaps, and um, and I will simply uh, invite people to come back tomorrow. There, you will have received a, 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 Zoom, a Zoom note about uh, the, the link. Uh, come back tomorrow at, at noon Pacific time and uh, you're, gonna read, you're gonna read to us. Yes, I'm gonna, cause it's like 30 minutes and I realized I can read like the whole of my new book, which is designed, it was written like to be read during the course of one person drinking one cup of tea so if you come back tomorrow just please like make yourself a dramatic chai latte um from a thermos mm -hmm. and just let's see if it's true let's okay. see if we can do that um goodbye everybody um cecil can i stay on with you a bit afterwards yes yes you yes may. Okay. <laughs>